Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participant lines are in a listen-only mode. After today's presentations, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, and you may do so over the phone by pressing star then 1 at that time. Today's conference call is being recorded. If you have any objections to this, please disconnect. Now, I would like to turn the call over to your host for today, Ms. Rhea Guy. Ms. Guy, you may begin. Thanks so much, Brad. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rhea Guy, and I work in the One Health office of the National Center of Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of the One Health office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly Zoonoses and One Health Updates call for today, February 5th, 2020. So Who Call content is directed to epidemiologists, laboratorians, scientists, physicians, nurses, veterinarians, animal health official, officials, and other public health professionals at the federal, state, and local levels. Please be aware that CDC has no control over who participates on this conference call. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality during these calls cannot be guaranteed. Today's call is being recorded, so if you have any objections, you may disconnect. Detailed instructions for obtaining free continuing education are available on our website and will be give, given at the end of the call. These presentations will not include any discussion of, an unlabel, of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses or partners disclose that they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. Before we begin today's presentation, Colin Basler, a veterinary epidemiologist with CDC's National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, will share some news and updates. Colin, please go ahead. Thanks, Rhea. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's Zohu Call, and welcome to our new participants. The Zohu Call audience continues to grow, with subscribers representing professionals from government, non-government organizations, industry, and academia, including students. We appreciate your help spreading the word about the Zohu Call. Please continue to share the Zohu Call website link with your colleagues from human, animal, environment, and other relevant sectors. The site includes links to past call recordings, information on free continuing education for a variety of professionals, and a link to subscribe to the Zohu Call email list. To begin today's call, I'd like to share some highlights from the One Health News from CDC, included in today's Zohu Call email newsletter. CDC's latest antibiotic resistance investments map is now available. And the United Nations has declared 2020 the International Year of Plant Health. Some upcoming conferences include two here in Atlanta. The 2020 INFORM conference will be from March 9th through 12th, and the 2020 Epidemic Intellig Intelligence Service EIS conference will be from May 4th through 7th. Applications are being accepted for the David J. Senker Scholarship to attend the EIS conference. We've shared links to recent publications on several topics, including pool code updates and use of the model aquatic health code in local jurisdictions, rabies outbreak in captive big brown bats used in white nose syndrome vaccine trials, and the AVMA guidelines for the euthanasia of animals, the 2020 edition, um, has just been published. Recent publications in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report of interest include Can Canada Oris Isolates, resistant to three classes of antifungal medications from New York 2019, notes from the field about the 2019 multi-state outbreak of eastern equine encephalitis virus, and a third publication that just went live uh, a few minutes ago, um, the MMWR on the initial public health response and interim clinical guidance for the 2019 novel coronavirus outbreak, United States, December 31st, 2019 to February 4th, 2020. Regarding, CDC, regarding uh, outbreaks, CDC is closely monitoring an outbreak of respiratory illness caused by a novel coronavirus first identified in Wuhan, Hubei Province, China. 
please see CDC's website for more information, travel recommendations, and resources. A new outbreak of salmonella infections linked to small pet turtles has been posted, and updates for outbreaks of E. coli infections linked to romaine lettuce and fresh express sunflower crisp chop sales salad kits have also been posted. A selected list of ongoing and past U.S. outbreaks of zoonotic diseases, as well as information on staying safe and healthy around animals, is available on CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. The complete CDC current outbreak list, including foodborne outbreaks, is available at cdc.gov outbreaks. As always, if you would like for us to share news from your organization, or if you want to suggest presentation topics or volunteer to present, please contact contact us at zohucall at cdc.gov. Again, thank you for supporting the Zohu Call and for joining us today. We've got an exciting lineup of speakers and topics, and I'll now turn the call back over to Ria. Thanks so much, Colin. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following objectives. Describe two key points from each presentation to describe how a multi-sectoral One Health approach can be applied to the presentation topics to identify an implication for animal and human health, to identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention, detection, or response to public health threats, or finally, to identify two new resources from CDC partners. Questions for all presenters will be taken at the end of the call. Please call 1-800-857-9665 and enter participant passcode 623-6326. Then press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of each question. You'll find resources and links for all presentations on our website and in today's So Who Call email. I'm now excited to announce our first presentation, which is called Ticks tortoises, and tick-borne relapsing fever in the Mojave Desert, which will be given by Molly June Bechtal. Molly, please go ahead and begin when you're ready. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk about a very understudied relationship between a vector and its host, the desert tortoise in the Mojave Desert. So I'm going to start by giving some background on the Mojave Desert tortoise. So Mojave Desert tortoises are keystone species. They create a lot of habitat with, for, with their bur burrows for a myriad of species, um, from rodents to birds to even insects. Unfortunately, their populations have been declining since the 80s, and they were listed as threatened by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services in 1990. Uh, Tortoise populations are monitored because in order to keep tabs on their populations per government regulation, and we look for things like clinical signs of disease as well as other morphometrics just like size of the tortoise and weight. Uh, ticks are also often noted on these tortoise health assessments. In fact, uh, ticks are known to commonly parasitize desert tortoises. And the two species we know that do commonly parasitize tortoises are Nisodorus parkeri and Nisodorus park. Terracotta. Um, they're often called tortoise ticks, especially in the tortoise literature, uh, mostly because they're difficult to identify. You have to count the number of bumps on the back to be on their backs to be able to distinguish the two species apart. Uh, or they're also just listed as Ornithodora species when they're found on tortoises. So these are soft ticks, and their biology is a little bit different than hard ticks. They are nidiculous, meaning that they like to be in dark burrows and dark places. So tortoises really create excellent habitat for these guys in their burrows. Um, they're generalists, which means they're not specific to one particular species for their blood meal. They'll feed on anything, any animal that comes their way. And they commonly parasitize desert tortoises. They're also vectors of the causative agent of tick-borne relapsing fever. Tick-borne relapsing fever is caused by a wide variety of species in the genus Borrelia. It's a familiar genus because Lyme disease is also caused by a species of Borrelia, but I'm going to be focusing on the relapsing fever Borrelia in the, that occur in the New World. And you can see the New World clade includes three species of Borrelia, um, two of which are specialized with their tick vector, Ornithodorus parkeri and Ornithodorus terracotta, that occur in the Mojave Desert and um, parasitize desert tortoises. Both species of Borrelia cause tick-borne relapsing fever, or TBRF, in people. 
PDRS is characterized by high fever, around 103 to 105 degrees, headache, muscle, and joint aches, um, symptoms very similar to the flu, uh, except these symptoms will reoccur. So usually with a fever and other symptoms lasting for about three days, followed by an afebrile period for about a week, and then those symptoms will return for another three days. This cycle can occur several times without treatment. Sometimes symptoms will resolve on their own, but it's treated with antibiotics like doxycycline. And this can also occur in pets if they get bit by a tick carrying a relapsing fever group Borrelia, such as dogs. These relapses are due to the ability of the Borrelia to undergo multiple cyclic antigenic variations. So what happens is Borrelia evades their antibodies by switching the surface proteins they express and become unrecognizable to the immune system. These relapses can make TBR, TBRF difficult to diagnose, but also people will go into the doctor, um, complain of symptoms that are very similar to the flu, uh, flu, and they'll be prescribed antibiotics and get better, and then they're never tested for TBRF. So it's thought that TBRF is underreported. Regardless, ticks are common in desert tortoise habitat and do come in contact with people, which suggests that they are a transmission risk. But very little, very little is known about the ticks in the Mojave, and even less is known about the relationship to their host, the desert tortoise. Um, we do know, though, that about 10% of wild desert tortoises uh, that are sampled are parasitized by ticks, and almost half of all active tortoise burrows are infested, particularly with Ornithodorus parkeri. So we also know that tortoises create habitat for rodents, which are documented as reservoirs of TBRF Borrelia group in other parts of the country. So tortoises may not even be a part of this transmission cycle other than serving as a source of nutrition and creating habitat for these ticks. But the fact remains that tortoise biologists do come in contact with these tick species, as well as hundreds of pet owners in Las Vegas who have adopted desert tortoises. Um, and these ticks are competent vectors of a pathogen that is harmful to people. So there is a disease risk of transmission. And doctors should consider tick-borne relapsing fever. In fact, we do have two cases to illustrate that it is a uh, transmission risk. So the first case study I'm going to talk about happened in 2017. Um, this happened to a tortoise biologist that was working at a study site about two hours north of Las Vegas. She was out sampling wild tortoise burrows. She did notice that there were ticks around the burrow, and about a week after she got home from her field trip, she became ill with a high fever. Um, then the high fever went away after a few days, only to return. So we actually took a blood sample, and her she did test positive for TBRF Borrelia by qPCR. Um, the second case happened a bit more recently. Again, this is a tortoise biologist, except she was working at a captive site near Las Vegas, and that captive site is pictured um, in the middle picture there to the right. Uh, after working in this captive site, digging up burrows about a week later, she did notice that she had been bit by a tick, and she became ill with a very high fever and other flu-like symptoms. Um, and this cycle repeated until the third cycle actually prompted her to go to the ER. Um, and because she was aware of the case that occurred in 2017, she asked the emergency room doctors to test her for Borrelia, and she did test positive for Borrelia um, and was treated with doxycycline and her symptoms subsided. So we do have two confirmed cases of tick-borne relapsing fever occurring in the Mojave Desert after exposure to these tortoise ticks. So we want to learn more about the relationship between this vector and the host, it's desert tortoise, the desert tortoise, um, because these ticks Ticks are a risk factor for not only biologists, but like I mentioned, desert tortoise pet owners that live throughout Las Vegas. To shed some light on this relationship, I analyzed those desert tortoise health assessments that are required by the, gov by the government, and I analyzed health assessments from 2007 to 2017. I looked at presence in relation, tick presence in relation to tortoise morphometrics, location, and clinical signs of disease. So I use a GLM and I bin my ticks into categories based on the range they're given on the health assessment data sheet because they're not asked for uh, an exact number. So I use the median number for each range. And in instances where uh, ticks were recorded as greater than 10, I just use the number 10. And in rare cases when the technician actually counted the exact number of ticks that were observed on the tortoise, I use that exact number. I also bin clinical signs into total number of clinical signs. 
Um, my initial re uh, analysis, I found that about 8,341 ticks were noted on tortoises on, um, over this 10-year period. 494 of these ticks occurred on tortoises at the study site Coyote Springs, which is where case one was exposed to ticks. But most of them, almost 7,000 ticks were noted on tortoises at captive sites. And this is where case two was exposed to tortoise ticks. So from my model, I found that ticks were more likely to be found on females and males. And they were statistically significantly more likely to be found on captive sites than wild sites, which makes sense. Um, and as far as my clinical signs go, I found that ticks were associated more with a tortoise that has a very low body condition score of three or one that has a very high body condition of seven, as well as weak posture and a higher number of total observed clinical signs, while fewer ticks were observed on tortoises with forage evidence. But what can we glean from this analysis about tick and tortoise, bio uh, tick and tortoise biology? Well, Ornithodorus ticks could be described as lazy, although they are just really well adapted for harsh environments like the Mojave Desert. These ticks stay in their burrows and nests, and they don't quest like hard ticks do for a blood meal. They're happy to just wait in their dark burrow for something to come along. In fact, some ticks have been documented to go for a year or more without a blood meal. So it would make sense then that tortoises that have a higher site fidelity, like females, that don't go from burrow to burrow looking for males for a mate um, would have a higher likelihood of getting ticks. Same goes for captive tortoises and tortoises that have more clinical signs of disease, which they just may not be feeling so hot, so they're choosing to stay in their burrows. But captive tortoises don't have a choice. So it would seem that if tortoises are in their, nor their normal, natural, healthy desert environment, they can scrape off ticks and choose different burrows, which is good, um, especially because captive tortoises are also more likely to come in contact with people. So to add to this story, oh, and tortoises with forage evidence, then it makes sense that they wouldn't have as many ticks observed on them because they can scrape their, the ticks off because as soon they are walking along the, through the desert looking for um, forage, so things to eat. So ticks can either be scraped off as they're leaving the burrow or they can decide to jump ship just because that intense sun is something that they want to hide from and they can hide under a rock or um, a dark piece of vegetation as the tortoise is wandering about the desert. To add to the story, we tested ticks collected from tortoises for Borrelia and interestingly, we found only seven out of the over 900 ticks that we tested positive for Borrelia, which is less than a 1% prevalence. It's pretty low, especially considering the density of ticks that are found in tortoise burrows. So TBRF is endemic in the West, but very little is known about the strains that occur in the Mojave Desert. In fact, this map on the top right corner from Forrester et al. includes cases of tick-borne relapsing fever that were caused by an Ornithodorus hermsi. Um, nothing is known about the prevalence of Borrelia parkeri and Borrelia ter terricata in the Mojave Desert. So going back to that low prevalence rate um, in the tortoise ticks, there is an interesting relationship that exists between um, reptiles and ticks in Northern California, where we see Ixodes specificus, the hard tick that carries the Lyme group Borrelia and causes Lyme disease, and um, Scolopers occidentalis, of this lizard that occurs in the same habitat. So what happens is that it's been found that this lizard has a component in its blood known as a Borrelia cytal factor or a Borrelia killing factor. So when these ticks come up and take a blood meal from this lizard, the Borrelia cytal factor in the lizard blood actually kills any pathogen, any Borrelia that that tick may be carrying. So it leaves that tick incapable of transmitting disease because the Borrelia has been killed. So what's really cool about this is in areas in Northern California where we see more lizards, we actually see fewer uh, infected ticks. And this Borrelia cytal factor is related to a thermal labile protein that does occur in reptiles such as tortoises but no research on resistance or susceptibility to tick-borne disease in desert tortoises exist. So this research is really just scratching the surface of ticks and tick-borne relapsing fever in the Mojave Desert, but we'd like to learn more about the relationship between tortoises and ticks. Rodents also share burrows, as I mentioned, with tortoises, so we don't know 
if they are helping to maintain the pathogen and tortoises are creating this perfect habitat for a potential reservoir host as well as the ticks, um, and which would help maintain Borrelia in the system. Or if they do have a Borrelia cytal factor in their blood, like the lizards in Northern California, and are helping to keep Borrelia at a very low prevalence. Regardless, we know that tick-borne relapsing fever cases may increase as people continue to encroach on the Mojave Desert. And research to better understand the zoonotic disease dynamic is important to maintaining public health and potentially to help conserve populations of the threatened desert tortoise. So with that, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators and funders, as well as the Zoonosis and One Health Updates call for giving me the opportunity to talk about this cool research. Thanks so much, Molly. That is indeed very cool research. Um, so our next presentation is 2019 AAFP Feline Zoonoses Guidelines, and this will be given by Michael Lappin. Michael, when you're ready, please begin. Thank you very much. That was a great first talk, and I'm quite honored to be on the call today. This is my first experience, even though I've gotten to work with the CDC in a number of different ways over the years, including with our WASAVA One Health Committee, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But certainly anyone has follow-up calls. I believe Helen has made the email address available already, but uh, please follow up if indicated. I direct the Center for Companion Animal Studies at Colorado State, which is a nonprofit that's really our mission is to promote research by young people. Um, we fund a number of seed money grants to help people do clinical, uh, usually non-fatal research. But today I'm uh, serving as a representative of the American Association of Feline Practitioners. As you can see, I'm a DVM. Uh, my PhD is in parasitology and I'm board certified in small animal internal medicine. This particular call does not have any uh, direct competition uh, to, or any conflicts to report, but I do always thank all the different sponsors of our student granting projects, the Young Investigator Awards, for giving gift money to help promote research by the next generation of, of veterinarians. So for today, I'd like to introduce you to our Wasava One Health Committee. Michael Day from Bristol was our founder. It was his dream to have this small animal group be more active on the world stage for One Health issues. If you're not familiar with our group, we now have over 120 member countries or delegations around the world. And because of the AVMA being part of our group, that puts us over 200,000 veterinarians uh, that we contact, hopefully, with our work. Casey's been our representative for the CDC since the uh, inception of this particular um, endeavor. And as you can see, we currently have two medical doctors that serve, with William working mainly with comparative oncology, and Chand, who's a DDM, is the other part of comparative oncology. Peter is an MD in Rhode Island that is, happens to be married to a feline specialist, and so he does recognize the health benefits of pet ownership. So this particular group has been involved with the AAFP Zoonoses uh, Committee, which we'll talk about today, indirectly as well as directly. So for example, Peter co-serves on our AAFP Zoonoses guidelines as well as our One Health Committee. And as we develop these guidelines, which are uh, the second edition, the first edition was over 10 years of age, so we felt that it was time to refresh these. What we've done with our guidelines, if you're not familiar with the AAFP, which by the way is catvets.org, if you're not familiar with our guidelines, we tend to find topics that we believe are important. Um, we often co-sponsor with the International Society of Feline Medicine, or we will co-certify each other's guidelines. This particular document, Carol Glasser from Pediatric AIDS uh, in San Francisco in the old days, uh, Carol was a repeat medical doctor that's also a doctor of veterinary medicine uh, on this particular document. 
Bottom line is then a group of these feline specialists or feline interested individuals, uh, then we interact with attempting to come up with a document that we feel is probably most commonly read by veterinarians, but we are attempting to advance our One Health mission by uh, interacting more closely with our especially primary care physicians. This particular uh, page is just to point out that this document, when we had finished at the committee level, had approval from our board. We also then asked the Companion Animal Parasite Council, which is one of the parasite groups in the United States, WASAVA, and the International Society of Feline Medicine to evaluate the document for accuracy, for one thing, and then also to whether or not they wanted to state an endorsement. The messages that I wanted to get across to the group today, which I know has a, a, quite, a great mix of different types of scientists, is that practicing veterinarians, they have to know many different things, multiple species, infectious diseases, and one health issues are obviously not our only uh, thing that we need to focus on in our practices. So it's great that we have such excellent resources like the capsivet.org for the American Parasite Guidelines. The ISCAP group uh, has had theirs translated into several different languages, uh, very similar to the American Guidelines. And all the great work that the CDC has done with Healthy Pets, Healthy People, and it's been great to interact with that team, including Casey. So that's uh, one of my most important go-to sites when I'm working with my lay people, owners of cats. And then, of course, uh, Bayer has done a nice job with their CVBD site. Uh, if nothing else, our world occurrence maps uh, for when animals come into the United States. And we don't actually know, a practicing vet might not know what vector-borne diseases were endemic in that country. Those uh, worldwide occurrence maps are quite helpful. We also work with the other uh, publications from the NIH, uh, uh, other federal agencies. Uh, AIDS Info has been used you know, quite frequently by our group and others over the years, uh, trying to really educate veterinarians for the most part, and then make sure that our veterinarians and physicians that are helping these family units, uh, of folks that own cats, are on the same way at, uh, wavelength. Some of the graphics that have been developed uh, are, are just fantastic and uh, really, I think, is very helpful in, in helping people understand that they can potentially enjoy the health benefits of pet ownership, but still trying to avoid those real potential zoonotic issues. So again, uh, from the cat side of things, being an AAFP member, I've got to admit our side is that Pets are good, cats are good for you, and uh, we uh, certainly encourage and applaud those that have been studying you know, the, the uh, benefits of pet ownership. Uh, my wife's a veterinarian as well, and we both uh, have agreed, well, we're in our 20th season together, to own four dogs and four cats at any one time. And we've kept that packed for a long time, but we also realize that, that there are health risks from those kitties and we have to be careful as you know our lives change and perhaps health issues develop. But what we believe from the um, AAFP side of things, and I hope this is the message that you'll get if you read that document that uh, should be posted as well with the slides, we really would like to strengthen that interaction between physicians, veterinarians, and the family. I think we all are familiar with some of the misperceptions of risk of individual cats for, say, acquiring toxoplasma. Yeah, that, oh, gosh, in the early days of HIV and certainly for a long time with pregnant people, a lot of folks, you know, assumed that you could increase your safety level by not owning cats, but not concurrently reminding people to wash their hands after gardening or to wash their produce well. So I think our goal from the AAFP in this document in particular is to at least try to have accurate information to the readers of the document to help people at least start on this uh, even playing field when giving owners advice. 
what I've personally said myself many times is I, I don't tell people to own cats or dogs. I don't tell them to get rid of their cat or their dog. But if there is a health issue that might relate to pet ownership, I believe that we should give them accurate information so the family unit can make their decisions. And of course, doing that, uh, working with the physician directly would, would give us the most strength. So our goals from the feline internal medicine or feline practitioner side of things is really to make sure that our laypersons realize that that uh, animals that are sick, if their cat has clinical signs of disease of any flavor, they could potentially have something that would be a little bit more likely to be shed to a family member. And so our goals are just to make sure that our folks realize in the sick animal arena to uh, allow us to do appropriate tests, diagnostics, consultations, and in the wellness side of things, we certainly would like our owners to allow us to provide our strategic deworming, our flea and tick control that could help with potential shared vector zoonoses. And then, of course, our goals with the vets are to make sure that veterinarians realize that if animals are sick, they're a little bit more likely to be potentially a zoonotic health risk, but also realize that there is benefit to flea and tick uh, preventative measures. Obviously, rabies is our biggest worldwide problem uh, that we want to make sure that countries that don't have current prevention programs uh, get that stepped up over time. And then again, as I've emphasized on the previous slide, I think one of our biggest messages, both from AAFP as well as WASAVA, is that the veterinarian half of the family medical uh, support would certainly love to work more closely with the physicians in a One Health arena. What we did with our document, uh, both versions, including the 2019, which by the way uh, just came out in December, so a fairly, fairly new document for us. We've gone ahead and talked about the animal contact zoonoses. Uh, again, we believe that veterinarians are interested in what they might catch at work. And then, of course, pet owners are very interested in what they might acquire from touching their cat. But we do spend uh, time talking about contaminated vehicles. Uh, can, uh, shared vectors, of course, are emphasized a lot, especially with the Bartonella issues. And then uh, shared environments, we make sure that um, we have at least some discussion about many of these zoonotic diseases are not acquired from touching the pet directly, but acquired from that shared environment. So just to give you a couple of examples, if you haven't had a chance to review the document yet, we uh, then have a specific table for each of those major direct zoonoses routes of transmission, and then have just a few words to remind people of the uh, most uh, common agents what you might suspect in a, a animal infected with that particular agent, and then the concurrent uh, illness in people. And then what we've done, again, because this is for primary care uh, feline practitioners as well as veterinarians in general, we did attempt to make some call-outs for some of our more uh, important things, like the example I've shared on this slide. Uh, all of our panelists were quite keen on uh, feeding processed foods, uh, especially if they're family members with immune deficiencies. This particular table is just uh, one of the, the examples of, of the starting of the list of the, the bite, scratch, and exudate associated uh, uh, organisms. Um, certainly, since we touch more cats than most, uh, we certainly have to be very cognizant as veterinarians that uh, bite wounds be managed appropriately. In fact, one of my research technicians today uh, just got a nice kitten bite uh, earlier this morning, so she has already returned from urgent care, thankfully. But we also try to get other points across that have been generated by the CDC and others uh, like that. Kind of a rumor amongst veterinarians uh, 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 that, that's kind of driven by one laboratory that perhaps we should be testing and treating all kittens for Bartonella. And that, of course, goes against our judicious use of antimicrobial guideline statements. And so we certainly pulled that one out as a, as a call out uh, for uh, that particular organism. 
So as you uh, read through the document, um, we certainly look forward to input, especially from PDC and folks that would be on a so type of call. We then tried to summarize uh, some of the general guidelines in one table for veterinary staff members and then a second table for owners. And then the AAFP, we do like to make brochures and things that are available for uh, distribution to clinics uh, and also to owners uh, to supplement what we might see on Healthy Pets, Healthy People at the CDC. We consider you guys to be the gold standard and, and appreciate the opportunity to work with, with Dr. Baravesh on those things. So bottom line is we try to get that message across that uh, clinically all cats should be seen. Healthy cats are relatively safe, especially if you wash your hands a lot, uh, feed processed foods, clean the litter box daily, et cetera. And uh, continue to try to interact more with our physician colleagues to spread the word. So, so far I think uh, we've gotten the point across hopefully that, that we believe at the AAFP level that most pets are safe in the cat world, especially specifically with AAFP. However, there are things that are shared, uh, so we are attempting to continue to partner with groups like Wasava. And Michael uh, headed this up. He was the chair of the committee um, at the time we published this paper. And I always uh, lovingly call this the other AAFP, uh, being the American Family Physician group rather than the CAT group. And we were quite pleased to have uh, one of our dual publications in that particular journal. And we'll continue to try to spread that word. Uh, one way that we're doing that is with a One Health certificate course for veterinarians, and we do allow animal technicians uh, to take this course as well. In the United States, the groups of lectures are race certified so that veterinarians can get CPD credit. Uh, certainly would love uh, any interactions from those on the call today if you'd like to visit the website. We're hosting that at CSU just because we actually have a system to do that, but it is a WASAVA endeavor. We have a number of One Health modules that still need to be recorded uh, and we look forward to having all 20 of these uh, online. And what we're doing with the veterinarians that are interested, they can earn a certificate by completing all the modules and that can be displayed in their veterinary clinics uh, showing that they have an interest and expertise in One Health. So thank you very much for listening today. I look forward to the next talk and then questions at the end or follow-up emails. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, our final presentation is Community-Based Prevention of Epidemic Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever Among Minority Populations in Sonora, Mexico, using a One Health approach. And it's going to be presented by Anne Straley. And please begin when you're ready. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, so this is a project that I was fortunate enough to work on as an EIS officer with the Red Cat Zoonosis branch. Um, I've since moved on from the Red Cat Zoonosis branch, so I'm giving this presentation today on behalf of my colleagues in RZB and also in Sonora, Mexico, who were unable to make today's Zohu call. So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, or RMSF for short, is caused by the obligate intracellular bacteria Rickettsia rickettsii, which likes to infect endothelial cells lining the blood vessels, which when damaged become leaky and results in a widespread vasculitis. So the picture at the bottom right-hand corner there demonstrates the endothelial cells of a blood vessel, which is cut in cross-section, containing the Rickettsia rickettsii bacteria, which is stained red. RMSF is a tick-borne illness and it is treatable with doxycycline, but treatment really needs to be initiated early in the course of illness to obtain the best outcome. Early symptoms, unfortunately, are fairly nonspecific, things like fever, headache, muscle pain, all of which can be easily confused with other diseases. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you some pictures of what advanced, severe RMSF looks like. Um, and I should warn you that some of these pictures can be graphic. Without timely treatment with doxycycline, RMSF progresses rapidly. Extensive vasculopathy results in necrosis and gangrene, which often requires amputation of digits or limbs. Other long-term sequelae can include neurologic complications, such as cognitive impairment or hearing loss, peripheral neuropathy, cerebellar or vestibular or motor dysfunction, just to name a few. Death occurs 
due to multi-organ failure and disseminated intravascular coagulation, and case fatality rates without timely treatment are around 25%. Epidemic RMSF is associated with massive local infestations of the brown dog tick, Repicephalus sanguineus, which is pictured here. The brown dog tick has actually been recognized as a vector of RMSF in Mexico and the American Southwest. Um, since the 1940s. The dog is the preferred host for all life stages of the brown dog tick, but the tick will also readily infest human dwellings and kennels when it's not on the dog. And the red arrow here is pointing to a tick that was spotted on the wall of a house in our intervention area. So dogs can be heavily infested with ticks like in the photos here. And actually each one of the little black spots on the brown puppy in the picture on the right there is a tick. And again, another picture of a dog heavily infested with tick. Each one of those little gray blubs on that dog's ear is a tick. So these heavily infested dogs support large populations of ticks in very close proximity to humans. And the warm climate in Mexico provides a suitable environment for ticks to be active year-round. So this isn't a seasonal problem. As a result, the ticks are everywhere. They're in the houses, they're in the yards, they're on the dogs. They're almost impossible to escape. And humans are bitten as a result of contact with tick-infested dogs or tick-infested environments. And kids are especially at risk of exposure because they have increased contact with dogs and spend more time playing in spaces where ticks live, like in the yard. So in case you're unfamiliar with where Sonora is, um, Sonora is a state in northwest Mexico, which is outlined here in red, and it borders the U.S. states of Arizona and New Mexico to the north. During the time period from 2004 to 2016, there were almost 1,400 of RMSF cases reported in the state of Sonora, with 250 deaths almost. 75% of those cases corresponded to people living in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Between 2009 to 2015, there was one small impoverished community in particular that was severely affected by RMSF. They had median cumulative incidence rates of 29 cases per 100,000 people, which is around six times the median cumulative incidence rate for the rest of the state. Three quarters of those cases occurred within just a 10 block area that consisted of 703 households, so quite a, a focal um, occurrence there. In 2015, the Mexico Ministry of Health actually declared RMSF an epidemiologic emergency. So this is a picture of Community A. Um, the, the Community A is that severely affected 10 block section that we talked about on the previous slide. It's part of a larger but still impoverished rural community that's located about 50 miles from Hermosillo. Um, community A is inhabited predominantly by agricultural laborers with a majority of migrant families coming from Oaxaca and other states in the south of Mexico. So Community A was selected as our intervention community. Community B, which was selected as the control community, is an impoverished suburban community of about 730 households that located on the outskirts of Hermosillo. It was selected because it was geographically isolated from Community A, which was important to limit the possibility of intervention bleed over but also because it was highly impacted by RMSF, although not necessarily to the degree that Community A was. In fact, no other community was hit quite as hard by RMSF um, as Community A. So Community B experienced six cases of RMSF during 2009 to 2016, three of which were fatal and one of which occurred in a child. So now we're going to take a closer look at the intervention, um, the goal of which was to reduce the number of human RMSF cases. The intervention was designed using a One Health approach with components targeting animals, the environment, and people. We sought to control ticks on dogs, control ticks in the environment, and educate people in the community about RMSF. So if this sounds familiar, it's because this approach was modeled off a very successful intervention that was previously used in Arizona. So component number one, control ticks on dogs. Um, each dog received two collars, like you see in the photo here. The gray collar is the tick collar. This is a collar that contains uh, flumethrin and imidacloprid. It provides tick control for up to eight months, and it actually holds up pretty well in a desert environment. Dogs have to be at least eight weeks old, and it has to be fitted and worn correctly for maximum effectiveness. The red collar is just a simple nylon collar. It was provided so that people would not attempt to handle or restrain dogs using the gray collar, because the gray collar, the tick collar, is actually designed to break off if the dog struggles against it. The red collars are also a fairly handy and visible marker um, that dogs are participating in the intervention. So puppies less than eight weeks of age, and therefore too young to receive a collar, were instead treated with uh, fipronil spray, and they were aged based on their dentition. 
Component number two, control ticks in the environment. Participating homes received pesticide applications with deltamethrin on a bimonthly basis. The deltamethrin was applied by vector control operators with the Sonora Department of Health, and homes were sprayed inside and outside, and the adjacent yard areas were also treated. Component number three was to educate the community. So here we developed a pictorial bifold pamphlet um, to use in this area. Literacy is uh, quite variable in this community. And Triki, which is the indigenous language which is spoken by many residents in Community A, is actually not a written language. Um, so we had community health workers that spoke Triki that were available to translate for households that did not speak Spanish. These pictorial pamphlets covered how RMSF is transmitted, the signs and symptoms of the disease, when to seek care from the health clinic, and how to prevent it. So it wasn't ethical to just do nothing for Community B or Control Community, um, given how serious RMSF is. So Community B continued to receive the standard RMSF prevention activities used by the Ministry of Health, which includes community education and environmental care site treatments of home. I should also mention that the larger town outside of the 10 block area that made up Community A um, also continued to receive the MOH standard of prevention for RMSF during the study period. So the real difference here between the intervention and control communities is the provision of tick collars on the dogs. There were a number of different measures that we collected during the study. Uh, we did a pre and post knowledge attitudes and practices or CAP survey that collected information on a number of different things, um, including dog ownership practices, tick contact, and awareness of RMSF. We also visually inspected a systematically selected random sample of dogs for ticks, and these tick counts were categorized as no tick seen, 1 to 10, 10 to 100, and over 100 ticks. The study took place during March to November of 2016. So beginning in March, we registered homes and collected the pre-cap survey data. We did the first environmental acaricide treatment. And in Community A, we enrolled dogs and applied the tick collars. We went back to both communities in May, July, and September, where uh, we did the uh, tick burden, the monitoring of the tick burdens on dogs, and the participating homes received another round of acaricide treatments. In Community A specifically, uh, we also replaced lost tick collars and gave new dogs new collars um, during each of those visits. And finally, in November, we collected the post-cap survey data and did a final tick count on the dogs. So we don't have time to go over all the results. So for today's presentation, I'm just going to focus on the measures of tick contact and the visual burden of ticks on dogs. The first result that I want to highlight is the number of households of dogs with dogs with ticks. So both community A and B saw a decrease in visible tick infestations on the dogs. But it was only in community A, which is the purple line here, um, where that decrease was statistically significant. So in community A, at the beginning of the study, a full one-third of households had a dog with ticks. And that number decreased to only 9% of households by the end of the study. The second result that I want to highlight is the reported tick activity by homeowners. So we asked participants if they saw ticks in their house, which is denoted by the orange line, um, or in the yard, which is denoted by the green line. And in Community A, which is the solid line, <laughs> uh, both of those measures actually decreased significantly, while in Community B, which is the dashed lines, both of those measures actually increased during the study. So there were far fewer households in Community A that reported seeing ticks in their house or in their yards at the end of the study compared to the beginning and also compared to uh, Community B. So we'll finish up with perhaps the most important result of all, which is the number of human RMSF cases. So in Community B, there were two confirmed cases of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and one death reported during the study period. While in Community A, there were actually no cases of human RMSF reported during the study period. And in fact, there were no human cases of RMSF reported in this area until April of 2018, which is a full 18 months after the study ended. So in conclusion, we were able to demonstrate that this One Health approach successfully prevented RMSF cases in a high-risk, heavily impacted, and impoverished area of Sonora, Mexico. So each element in this strategy really contributed to a decreased number of dogs with ticks, decreased the number of ticks that people saw in their house or in their yard, and also contributed to an increased awareness of RMSF in the community. And all of these different components together resulted in a decreased number of human RMSF cases and deaths. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your time and attention. 
Thanks so much, Anne. It's always great to see those types of One Health approaches occurring in the field. Um, at this time, we'd like to take questions from any of our presenters. Um, if anyone in the audience has a question, please call 1-800-857-9665 and enter participant passcode 623-6326. Press star 1 and give the operator your name and affiliation. Please name the presenter or topic at the beginning of your question. So Brad, do we have any questions yet? And once again, that is star one. If you are already on the phone, please press star then one at this time. One moment, Miss, while we gather questions. We have Christina Nelson from the CDC. Ms. Nelson, please go ahead with your question. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to say the Zoho call always has good speakers, but the speakers today were particularly excellent. I, I really enjoyed all of these presentations, so thank you to everyone. Um, my question is specifically for Mike Lappin. Um, I know you mentioned that for cats, um, for owners who are immunocompetent, um, it is not recommended that um, veterinarians test or treat for Bartonella if the cats are asymptomatic. Um, for immunocompromised owners, my understanding was that the recommendation is still the same, um, that, you know, if the cats are asymptomatic and the owners are doing okay, um, asymptomatic in terms of no evidence of cat scratch disease or other things, um, then the cat still should not be tested or treated for Bartonella um, because, you know, it's hard to give antibiotics to the cats and sometimes the owners get scratched when they're trying to give the antibiotics. So I was just wondering your comments on that. Have any recommendations changed and any other thoughts? Yes. Yeah, so oh, thank you so much for the kind comment about the lectures. I certainly enjoyed the other two a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, to directly answer this question, uh, we follow the lead for the CDC, of course, and AIDS info and pet ownership by immune compromised people. And um, I support those recommendations is that, honestly, uh, doing something like soft claws and flea control is probably going to uh, control the majority of zoonotic transmission of Bartonella by flea dirt and or scratches. And so our group, the AFP, a uh, group of veterinarians, we don't support testing and treating cats of, of immune suppressed families in general. However, the caveat does always come up is what if they walk in and they say, I've heard about Bartonella and my cat has had fleas and I'm going to relinquish the cat unless I know. And in that case, you know, I believe that most veterinarians would go ahead and test, uh, even, uh, I guess, hoping <laughs> for negative serology <laughs> and negative PCR so that we can then just put that to bad. Because, um, gosh, my, my, my clients, and well, I practice in Georgia, Oklahoma, California, and 30 years in Colorado, you know, once they know, even though they know there's or even though we tell them there's probably little risk, once they know they're having antibody positive or whatever, they do want to treat. So, so again, I think our overall recommendation would follow exactly the CDCs, which is there's probably no indication to test healthy cats of any family, but all families should do flea control and avoid bites and scratches. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Mike. That's very helpful. Once again, if you have a question and would like to ask it over the phone, please press star then 1 at this time. Please stand by for any further questions from the phone. And once again, that is star 1 for questions over the phone. One moment, please. Next, we have Dr. Pat Klein from the USDA Forest Service. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Pat Klein from the USDA Forest Service. My question is actually for Dr. Lappin as well. Um, I've actually had an opportunity to read the new um, zoonotic guideline, and it's very well done. 
I had one uh, quick question, if I could get some feedback from you. Regarding cats and toxoplasmosis, we do recognize that the felid or the cat is the definitive host. And as you are explaining in your guide, yes, oftentimes the exposure to humans is through an environmental um, exposure route. So um, how does AAF, um, AAFP stand, or what's your position on advocating to keep your cats indoors? I mean, all of your pet cats, for all the right reasons in a way, but also to not add to that environmental burden if they're going to be shedding toxicosis in the environment. Would you make any comments on that, please? Yes, thank you for that great question. Now, I did not serve on um, any of the cat wellness committee work from AAFB. I've just been with the zoonoses and vaccine guidelines. But you may know some of the listeners today, there's a, a, a kind of a large push from some feline practitioners uh, in that, you know, it's cats should be allowed to go outside. And so that particular, you know, discussion is, is a kind of a hot button amongst our team and, you know, with the trade-offs of, you know, cats behaviorally want to be outdoors, uh, whereas indoor cats live longer, uh, don't pass toxoplasm in the environment, don't eat, you know, hundreds of birds per year. You know, there's lots of great discussion on both sides. And so our committee uh, stayed a little bit out of that fray, um, but, but certainly it's a well established that it's not just domestic cats uh, that can complete the life cycle uh, of the organism as well. So uh, confining all cats indoors, you know, in theory would hopefully lessen the world's outdoor burden of toxo OSS, but it probably wouldn't eliminate it because of other, you know, competent felids. Thank you for that. And by the way, I own cats for 30 years and I adore them as much that since I'm a veterinarian as well, um, but none of my cats go outdoors. And I'm lucky because they've lived to be 18 and you know, 20 plus years. So I really love cats. I'm just looking out for their best interest as well. Thank you. Yeah, great comment for that. We love ours as well. And we've kind of had the compromise position that we actually have an outdoor cat run. Uh, but they do um, ingest birds, bunnies, and rodents, and one snake in their outdoor cat run. So they weren't eaten by the coyotes, but they've certainly eaten their share of other creatures. And so uh, I should probably test the soil there in their cat run to see if there's uh, T. gondii oasis. Thanks for your questions. We're going to wrap up now, um, but if you do have additional questions, you can also email the presenters. Uh, you'll be able to find their email addresses on the Zohu Call webpage for today's call. So I just wanted to say thanks again um, for all of today's speakers for their excellent presentations and give you a few instructions on continuing education. So you can receive free continuing education and that's available at cdc.gov forward slash one health forward slash Zohu forward slash continuing education. And the course access code is 1Health2020, all lowercase. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov forward slash TCE online by March 9th, 2020. A web on demand recording of today's call will also be posted online at cdc.gov forward slash one health forward slash zohu forward slash 2020 forward slash February HTML by March 10th, 2020. Our next call will take place on Wednesday, March 4th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please feel free to send suggestions and questions to zohu call at cdc.gov. And for more information and to subscribe to our email newsletter, please visit cdc.gov forward slash one health forward slash Zohu. Thanks again to everyone for your participation and we will now end today's call. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation on today's conference call. At this time, all parties may disconnect. Speakers, please stand by. <laughs>